So things like new, edit, update, and delete, and create. Uh, some of these slides are on my own, so excuse me while I catch up on just that. Um, so the first part he left off, he was talking about the posts and how that would show you all the posts in the database as an index and map to that index route. Post slash one uh, would actually, technically that should be post slash one because Ruby on Rails actually does a lot of magic with pluralizing. It'll actually change things on the fly. So if you type in a route, that should be. Um, so it makes more sense to think about post slash one. So Ruby as a convention will actually automatically change that for you. A um, couple little bits of magic. And so now we actually want to do more than look at posts that we've created. We actually now want to create posts. We want to change posts. We want to change the title, change their content, and we also want to delete them. And that's where REST comes back, and we can actually start doing a lot more with those other HTTP verbs. That's where we can start doing a lot more with our controller, and a lot more Ruby magic, because there's plenty to go around. I've been doing Ruby development for a year, and there's still bits of magic that go, what? How'd that happen? Um, so again, REST stands for Representational State Transfer. It gives you a really common nomenclature for doing things like create, read, update, delete in a way that's pretty much human readable. Um, you can go to a thing like Amazon or eBay, and they all have what's called RESTful APIs. So you can think of, for example, Amazon might have an index of items, so you'd have an items slash, um, and then you'd have various things that you can search by, so you can do a search query on things. And it's all done in a very easy to read way, as opposed to the old fashioned way where you'd have like index.php, question mark, variable one equals blah, variable two equals blah, and it's just very unruly. So now you can do, you can actually have slashes in there to represent that, and it gets rid of a lot of that extra cruft. Um, so again, it's a software engineering architecture um, that it really or is meant to organize those web requests. Uh, a couple, outlined a couple benefits, there's a lot more. So less overhead of exchanging information, and what that means is there's, traditionally there's been methods like, it's called SOAP. Um, SOAP actually passes around XML, and XML is, is a data interchange, so how you can actually package up data that you're looking for from a web app, it'll put a lot of extra tags. So kind of like an HTML page, it's structured very similarly, and that's just a lot more data in an environment where you don't really need that. You can actually infer a lot of those details, and that's what Ruby aims, and Ruby and REST and all those other principles aim to do. Again, human readable, you can understand and expect what you're gonna get from a URL and what you're gonna get from data. So if I do um, cart, or let's say post slash one, I know I'm gonna get the first post. If I do posts, I know I'm gonna get all the posts. Um, if I do a delete, to post slash one, I'm gonna delete the first post, right? Um, so it's actually a way that you can read a URL and it can actually make sense. And the third is a, is a bit technical. Um, I won't get into too much depth, but you can actually create stateless web applications. And what that really means is it doesn't matter how much I've been doing with the website, I can still do post slash one, and post slash one will never change. Um, it doesn't matter how much I've done before, because I'm telling the web server everything it needs to know to be able to give me that same result. Um, and that has a lot of really cool implications on like scaling, um, so you can add a lot more servers. If you have more questions on that, I'll chat more later. Um, and so REST achieves this by utilizing those HTTP verbs I wasn't talked about before. Um, specifically, the five main ones that Ruby cares about are Git, and Git, we talked about obviously, and we can do things like viewing all of a resource, or we can just show to a specific resource. Put is typically the way that Rails allows you to change a post, so we can change the content, or we can change the title of the post <coughs> using a put request. Post, we can do actually create a new object. Um, for example, if I want to create a new post, I would have a form that would post the title of the content to the URL, and then it would create a new post. Delete, obviously, if I send a delete message to a URL, then I can delete it. And patch, it's kind of an interesting case, actually. Um, patch is brand new as of Rails 4. Rails 4 isn't even released yet. Um, 
But the typical way to update attributes was to use a put, which really isn't what the intention of put was for. Um, so they put out the, the patch method. No one thought too much more about it, but um, so it comes out really It's a cool little tidbit. So, sorry, so with patch being used to update, what would put be used for now? Since post is also to create. Um, it was actually just, so if I just <laughs> wanted to change the content of an existing post, that's what patch would be, because you're patching the content of an existing post. Um, previously, put. Put is kind of used synonymously, kind of, it's kind of like the git of post. So post, normally you actually if you do a post and code of all your variables. Put, you can actually do the traditional, um, put your arguments in the URL string. That's where they kind of differ, and that's the intent of them. That's why they implemented patch, and patch could be kind of that just change the content or change the attribute to the resource. That makes sense? Yeah. Um, so, knowing that these conventions exist and the variables exist, there's actually a lot, of, a lot more Ruby magic that's possible, or Rails magic that's possible. So, going back to, I believe it was your question about do I need to go line by line and define all of these, you can actually go in your routes.rb and do this resources posts. And what that tells right, Ruby on Rails is that you have a CRUD resource, and then it will automatically implicitly create all of these routes for you. So we can do what Weston showed, we can actually do git posts, um, and we can do git post one, it'll create those automatically for us, but it'll also create all those other verbs and actions that we talked about. So we can actually create a new post by going to this URL, we can submit that new post by posting to just post, so you notice that we actually have the same URL here three times. Um, Post. We can post to slash post, we can put to slash post, we can delete to slash post. But basically, given the HTTP verb, we have different contexts for interacting with that URL. Um, so, those are an example of those. And, and if you go into here with resource posts, you can actually change all of these individually too. Um, Ruby on Rails has mechanisms for a lot of them as well. Uh, any questions with that? That kind of goes back to just extending from what. So now, um, yeah, this is old content. I didn't actually change this too much, but there's a piece down here that I specifically wanted to talk about that wasn't in the old side. Oh, yeah. um, this is actually an interesting bit of it's a Railsism that allows you to respond in different formats. Now, this is an interesting concept too because how many of you have used mobile apps in your phone? Mobile apps don't consume HTML data very well. There are some that do, but uh, the typical best practice is to actually use something like XML or something like JSON, and those are just ways to package up data. And so when you actually request these URLs, you can request what kind of information you want back. I want an HTML page, I want an XML document back, I want a JSON document back, because as a developer I want to interact with these data. Um, and so this is what this is actually for. And so respond to do format will push back the result from index. So when I request index, I can do index.html and that'll automatically go to here. And if I do index.json, um, it'll actually go to this and spit out JSON, that index page is a JSON file. Um, so that's really cool, something to just know. Um, so does that mean that you write the same application and you can have a mobile app written in whatever. You basically turn your web application into an API that can be consumed by a mobile app, yep. Can you do that without, you just skip the HTML pages and just make it a... There is that. Um, is that how people develop, you know, companies develop really big apps that are gonna be huge? Yep, uh, pretty much every major web application usually has an API into it as well. There's the best practices that go along with it. Um, a couple of those best practices actually um, forego doing this because you'll actually have to print what's called a namespace. So instead of having um, examplablog.com slash index, you could actually, you would actually probably do examplablog.com slash API slash index. 
So it's a whole separate. It'd pretty much be project, like two right? different Rails apps. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah, you can definitely do it like this too. This is a good way to start. And then as those big companies grow, you can just put them out because they want to do like so, so you can actually build a Rails app without any of that RESTful stuff because it's just really consuming a RESTful API then? Um, so really no, does it still have models then? Repeat your question. So if you're going to split those out and have an API and then a regular application, does that, you know, the web front end, just like a mobile front end, would be an application, a Rails app that really doesn't have no. models? Yeah. It just uses, consumes um, JSON? You can actually have a Rails application that doesn't spit out HTML. Okay. But that's actually a trend that's starting to pop out there is because they have full JavaScript front ends. There's, there's frameworks out there like Backbone. Oh, so you're not actually like writing a Rails app then for the front end? Um, correct. You would okay. actually have a completely separate server running. Because okay. really a mobile app is a, con is a consumer of data. Right. And so you, and the Rails app is more, is, is a piece of that is just getting the data out there. It's just how you format it. You need to format it with HTML and you format it with So you're using on JSON. Ruby on Rails just for a RESTful server? Yep, it's so definitely a possibility. Um, yeah. Other items? And then a bit about show. Did you show in the. Did you talk about show? Okay. What's your web page right now? Uh, it is elasticbackflip.github.com. So it's that same URL, except now it's instead of Rail Scaffold Part 1, it's Part 2. And so, let's see if I want to talk about particularly. And so again, just to reiterate what Weston talked about, for show, we have those smart URLs that go back into, right here, we have get post ones show, and that will show us a specific post. This will map to our post controller, and this will actually go to the show action, and then it will use this one as the ID. Um, and so that'll actually do that query into um, Active Record and get that first post and then render it back as HTML. Um, yep, there it is. So going back to what we talked about earlier, the post set ID, it's taking in that one there and then going and passing that into the show action. I can show you later. We'll get to So here's some code for show. Can we talk about that too? Mm -hmm. I remember talking about that. Okay. Then we'll read it. Yeah. And mostly just add the bit about rest. And so a lot of these functions, some new edit, create, update, and delete, are very, it's, it's the CRUD suite of act actions. Um, so this time we did index and show, now we can do things like we can do. So new will actually create a new post and then pass it back as an instance variable. And you can actually um, have a form for that which will post to create and then you'll have a new post and then you can use things like delete and update. The code for those are usually one or two lines and I'm actually gonna do a little activity where I can show you what those look like, but um, they're not too interesting to do in a format like this now that we've done index and show or show it in general format. Um, so now we're, I wanted to change gears and actually do a live coding session, which hopefully doesn't fail miserably, but <laughs> sometimes I do. Uh, so I actually want to show you the power of how quickly you can build a basic simple blog have with having a user log in, deploy it to the internet, and then um, add, create, and delete posts. So before I do that, does anyone have any burning questions before I do a whirlwind Ruby on Rails session? What are you going to deploy? Heroku. And I'll talk a little bit more about Heroku, but um, Heroku is a very easy way to deploy a Ruby on Rails application to the yeah. internet, basically. It takes care of a lot of system administration stuff for you. Yeah. And you can just push your code to that environment and <coughs> It understands Ruby on Rails, it'll just okay. do all the setup, set up the database, set up the routing, set up the domain, set up all that stuff, yeah. and then you're good to go. 
You don't have to fuss around with cash, you books, who's all that. Does all that for sure. Yep. All right. do an ls here and I look at that public directory, we'll see an index.html here. And that's what's going to make it just load that up. So if I actually look at the index.html page. There's going to be a bunch of HTML in there that created that. Um, so that's not too useful. That's just letting you know that Ruby on Rails is working. That's really just a test page. They've got a little bit of resources in there to help you get started. Yeah, see so right here. Set up a default and remove this file. So when I delete this file, so I have deleted the index file that this is rendering. And now Ruby on Rails is going to render something completely different. Well, that's good. It's hard. loaded my uh, practice run, and now I get an error. And that error says, I'm going to blow this up a little bit. No, mat no root matches git slash. What this is telling, what the Ruby on Rails is telling you is they don't, that roots.rb doesn't know what to do with your root um, request. So it doesn't know how to handle this. 
And so then we can go into our roots.rb file. Just use on text. So that lives in the config directory and got roots. There's a whole bunch of commented out text. You can largely ignore all of this. In fact, I'm just going to delete it so we can actually focus on what matters. Um, but there is one piece of commented code that I do care about. Sorry, would you change your text size and use one text too? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I can make the directory one there. That's fine. Yeah, that's good. We don't lose the tree element. No, what? <laughs> tree. Good tree. Yep. So, just to show you what happens when I set the root to. So, does anyone want to bark out and tell me what this is going to? Based on our earlier conversations with uh, the hash here. Index.html. Index.html's, yep. But it's going to be looking more specifically for the index action of the welcome controller, right? Yeah, so slash welcome slash Yep. Initialize constant welcome controller. That's telling us that object doesn't exist. So that's for me. Let's do some Ruby magic and make it exist, right? Um, so now another. Um, so Rails has a series of generators, and so anytime you run into a situation like I need a new controller called this, or I need a new object or a new resource called this, there's a series of um, generators that exist that can actually do that for you. Um, so I'm going to generate a controller called welcome with an index method. So this is going to generate our welcome controller with our index method. And remember, that's where our um, root directory is pointing, right? Welcome index. And you, what directory are you in before you move? Uh, this is in the root directory, actually. That's the root. This is the root directory. And actually, I think as long as you have any subdirectory within the root directory, I think it still works. Because it's magical. You bring it. So then it generates a whole series of stuff. Um, Mostly what we care about is it created that controller that previously didn't exist. It gave us a root for that controller method it just talked about. It created all of our views that relate. So we got our index.html and URB. And it created our controller. So now, it generated a bunch of other stuff, assets and tests that we don't particularly care about right now. Now if I reload my page, I want to get a welcome index and then it tells me where it is. Hooray! Um, so that's cool, but that doesn't really do very much for us. So let's start, let's create the last, what is it, six hours? I don't know, the last seven hours of work in one line of code. Here we go, generate, generate scaffold. Um, so what a scaffold is, is really it's going to be our post object, it's going to be our migration to create that post object that we made, it's going to be the controller that we need to have all the roots. It's going to update the roots. Uh, it's going to do all of those things that we had done earlier today. Um, generate scaffold post content. So if I forget things like, in this command, the title of this comes first. So if I'm, if I'm like, I know I want the post to contain content, and, and I want that content to be a text. I don't know, is this supposed to be te content text, or is this supposed to be text content? I don't remember, I can Google it or I can just try it. Um, so if I do that, I'm like, Cool. Oh, create a bunch of stuff. That's cool. Um, but then if I actually try to start using it, what the? What just happened? 
This is uh, Ruby on Rails complaining very loudly. Um, and you can, you can read it, eventually you start getting the hang of it, but what this is telling me is that it can't create that table because of the syntax of what I did earlier was wrong. So there's actually, with great power comes great destructive power. So I can actually do, go back up to where I generated that. And I can actually change generate to destroy. So if you ever screw up with the scaffold generation, you can literally redo it by replacing generate with destroy. And then it erases everything I, I goofed up on. And then I can try it. It doesn't necessarily track the files, it rather invokes remove or delete on the files that are mapped to that scaffold. Yes. So if you make a spelling error that doesn't perfectly match between the generate and destroy, you're not going to be aiming at the right place for your invoked uh, your invoked shell commands. So it's not binding, it's just pointing. Another string is payroll string. So now I know the correct order is what it is and then what it what it what it is and what it is. <laughs> so now I know that the content comes before text, all that comes before string and so forth. So now I can generate all of this. It's going to generate a whole bunch of stuff. And then just like Weston implied, and now we actually have this file up here. We have a migration. So now we need to tell our database environment that we just created a new model so we can actually interact with it in the database. And the Ruby command for that is rake db migrate. And that's actually going to run this db migrate create post file. And if I pull it up, it'll look familiar. Does that just do one, or can you have done multiple of those? It'll actually, the cool thing about migrates is it will run everything in this folder in sequential order. Okay. Um, so if I had 50 migrations in here, it would actually run through and see where it actually has migrated to, and then we'll just migrate from there. You can actually go back and forth. You can kind of think of it like a, a pile of migrations. So you can actually go back the pile and go forward. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. And the way that's possible is that there's a table in your database that is the migrations table. So every time the migration is successfully executed, it will be added to that. And so it just checks for the latest migration, compares against where you are, and then starts falling after the migration found in the table. Yep. So, um, Again, this is very similar to what we were looking at earlier. This was generated by that scaffold command, so it created a content, author, and title with their various types. Um, anytime you generate a new migration to it, it should pretty much always include the timestamps. And then I think there's two, the created at and the updated at. Just allows you to help track you know, when things sort of change in your database. And it does that by default. So if I run that migration, These migrations actually move data around, they don't just change the schema? Uh, they can do both, actually. Um, I mean, that's yeah. like the whole thing in itself. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. You can just, it, there's a lot of power in it. <coughs> you can use the, the relationships that you define in your models to change data. Mm -hmm. But it's migrations, so you cannot do it. <laughs> Um, a best practice is actually anytime you need to change data, you do it through migrations. Um, somebody else do it. Well, <laughs> if you have someone else to do it, yeah. <laughs> uh, so now we have a whole bunch of stuff. We should be able to access posts, we should be able to create posts, we should be able to delete posts, we should be able to do everything that we can do when Weston left us. Thanks, Weston. <laughs> and we did it with two lines of code. So now I should be able to go to my domain slash posts. And there's a post. Or no post because I didn't create it yet. So now I can create a post. USB3. So content. Screen down here. Screen author is me. And the title is something. That's great. And we'll hit enter on our form here. It's going to post to that. Um, What's actually doing here is it, it's posting to this slash post with all of those arguments. And when I'm going to that create method, 
And that create method was created with a, <coughs> that scaffold generation in our app controllers post controller. So now here is where it generated all that kind of boilerplate code that we talked about earlier. So here's that index that Wesley showed us, that post at all command. Um, same for show. Show is there as well. So that indent or that variable post is created by doing a query on that ID that came through. So in this case, if we did post slash one, it would do uh, post.find one, and that would return the post with the ID one. Um, but the particular one that we just did is down here on create. So Rails is doing a lot of magic here, but when you post to slash post, it routes to this create direct through the create method, creates an in instance of post by creating a new post with those parameters that we submit, so content, title, and author, and then responds by letting us know if it's successfully saved, this will return true, and then return that, um, what did it return, successfully created? Yeah, post was successfully created. And so that um, redirected to post. There's a bunch of magic going on here. Um, but it's redirected to our newly saved post object. And what that defaults to is actually um, post path. And post path will go to our show. So it's doing our show with this post variable that this passed in. If you wanted to do the format <clears throat> HTML or JSON, mm -hmm. how would you tell it from the URL string to turn JSON? I don't know if you can read that, but in the post slash one, if you tack on the dot JSON at the end, that is really sweet. Bam, what's, Bam magic. What's the, what that is implying is your HTTP request has a um, response data type, text slash JSON. <coughs> and so the URL informs the HTTP request to request a specific format, and then it responds with a specific format. Nice, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. It also handles XML by default. So I just added this bottom line, format XML, render XML post. I think, I've never actually tried this one. I'm curious, if I type like donkeys right here, <laughs> Donkey, you're cruising for a smack button. <laughs> it's, it's magical, but evidently you have to do a little more magic to get that magic. Um, sure, sure. Okay. So what's that do? <laughs> 43. Yep, so if I go back to my web app, maybe this will be easier to Post slash new gives you that new post form. And then those actually, you have to fill it in something, something, something. When I create and I push this button, that's sending that post request to slash posts, which is then going to, just like this comment indicates, okay. it's going to this create method. And so it's creating a new post method from those parameters within this form. And the reason why you send it for the new post object, even though the form also sends the parameters for the new post object, is that that form is specifically expecting a post instant variable. And so we're kind of throwing it away, but well, kind of not because it's expecting the form expects a post instant variable. So if we actually look at that new.html, oh man, too much magic. It's actually going in here and rendering this form. And so this goes back to what you were asking me earlier is where does the HTML start, where does the Ruby start? Or yeah, where's the separation there? 
there's a form for post, and that the app post was what was created in that new. It just creates a blank slate for us to work with. And so um, there's a bunch of crap we don't really care about right here, air handling. Who does that? Joke. Just laugh. <laughs> Uh, and so, but this is uh, generating those form fields. So we got a content, and so that'll associate the content field with that post author, with that post title, with that post. And so when we press this submit button, that's what's going to compile all that together. And then we can add those to our post object that was brand new. And then Doing so much, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, it's good. There's obviously a lots of files that have, in a sense, the schema structure kind of built. Mm -hmm. What if you want to add another field? Um, what's another good <coughs> for categories? A user. Yeah. Oh, there's that. Um, no, I can do this. This is the only one to do. How about we add a rating? So, oh, I almost TDD, but I can't. <laughs> um, so the way that we can do that, the first step is really generating that migration to add a new field to our post. And let's say we call it. What happens if we don't run a migration first? Mm -hmm. Try and just add it on. I like the early view. Yeah, I really want to do test-driven development right now, but that's a lot to teach. There's already. So I just follow pretty much the non finish that's going on. I could copy and paste, but then just be sick. So not. Um, so the rating. All of our conventions here. Just FYI, if the ERB looks like it's tedious with all the syntax, it is. There's just better templating things out there that will make it go faster. This is f dot integer. This is f dot projections. Camel um, or slim. You're right. No, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a more appropriate field here that I can't. So if I add that to our Undefined method rating for post. Does anyone remember getters and setters? Getters and setters are what it's using to generate these. So it's trying to call a get rating on our post object, but post that <coughs> rating doesn't exist because we haven't added it to our post object, right? So now if we go into our post.rb file, And we add grading here. That's going to fix our problem, right? Hooray! Oh, crap. Actually, do I need to be a little server for that? Yeah, we can see this symbol is going to be different. So, anytime you change a model, you have to reload the rest. And that's what you're using Zeus. That's what you're using Zeus? I probably should have started using Zeus because this is a big one. You don't have an end the JV in the HTML. You go over to I don't think that's not in there, but you're right. Does it does it really use the database field at this point? It shouldn't. It's going to be successful, which makes me think it's time to Live coding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's looking for a database field. Go to your schema.rb in your DB folder. Well, we know we didn't create the migration. Yeah, we didn't create it yet. We're just experimenting with why it didn't work. But I'm just going to generate the migration. So now we'll add that rating to add rating to host. Here's some more magic in case you were running out of magic. Um, you generate a migration with that prefix with add, 
it'll generate what's called a change migration. And it's expecting that what this is, is going to be added to this. Um, and so you can save yourself with having to actually touch the file by doing that. Um, there's also remove, or if you give it the, the variable name and the uh, variable data type, but you pass in two, let's say instead of just doing one argument, because that's just adding the rating field to post, if you were to pass in two um, pairs of data and data type, it would actually, instead of using the magic, it would um, create the migration according to the parameters that you sent it. So if I run, array, run that migration there, it'll create a new migration. Rating or string. Wouldn't it be rating? Call it string. Call this magic. It could be an Android, it could be a string. I'm just going to go on string. Yeah. Didn't that, yeah. Was you have a problem for them that flipped around? Um, Was it that one? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure the name of the first one would be. Yep. Undo. Destroy. Bye. That's why I'm a proponent of pair programming, by the way. Because if you don't know it, hopefully your uh, partner does. Nonetheless, there's you pair googling. What happens if you give them the database a data type that doesn't accept? So they yell at you. So they don't <laughs> do it. <laughs> Rails will most likely yell at you before it does anything that you can't undo. Uh, so now I generated that migration, so now if I look at the migration, it's going to add that column rating to our posts. I'm going to again rate Google Migrate. Actually push that into our database. Now, there it is. The race. Bam, new form. And the rest of the magic is actually also as well. How do you relate object to object? Uh, like if you want to I'm actually going to do that in a moment. Um, oh, right. okay, good. Yep. Sure. So now we've got a post. That's, we can delete posts, we can add in posts, we can do a whole bunch of stuff with posts. You can just do the index, just get the list of posts. Sure. Now you would. Since we just added a field, you would have to add in to this page, you would add in that um, rating, rating column in that data. And ID doesn't show here, but it's database is using it. Yep. You never really want to show your ID in most cases, but it's, it's being used. So, for example, if I go to show here, you'll see that it says post slash one, post slash two, okay. post slash three. So it knows. It's just not displaying it to the user because it's not particularly relevant. You more care about the title of the author and the content. So. so, let's add some authentication and users. Want to see how long that takes? Yes. Okay. Cool. So, we go back to our gem file here. And we're going to add a gem called device. Device is my recommended authentication engine. It'll handle things like signing up, signing out, Logging in, sending confirmation emails, doing API authentication with tokens, um, password resets. It's basically the whole authentication gamut of functionality. And integrating it as easy as adding the gem, letting Ruby know about our gem by running a bundle install. And it's going to pick up that we just added that uh, line device. See, using device. So now we're going to realize now. What was the command that you. Okay. Oh, sorry, bundle install? Bundle So anytime you touch your gem file or anything, you got to let Rails know that you have a new gem in there. So now we can do, and this is all documented on the uh, device GitHub page, but I'm just going to kind of breeze through it really quick. So now we can do another generator that when we added the um, device gem, was added to our Rails instance. So we can actually do Rails generate device install. That's right. And that basically plugs in device functionality to our Ruby on Rails. And just to so say you no, know, it's creating an initializer here. 
So there's actually a config file called device.rv that you can tinker with. Um, I'm not going to for lack of all of sanity, um, but you'll learn a little bit. So it plugs in all that functionality automatically. And so now we need to associate it with a new user. Can so we look at the routes.rv to yes. show where it is? So device is different from normal gems in that it's... I think it actually does more magic there as well. Oh, yeah. no, 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 no. We haven't generated a resource yet. We need to generate a resource. Okay. Once so, we generate the resource, we can see where it's found. Yep. And so the next step in Devise is actually associating it with a user model. And Devise will do that automatically. And that'll set up you know, the things like um, your controller, your device controller that handles all those routes. It'll set up your user resource, so things like name, email, password, it'll set up all that database and stuff. Um, so Rails generate device model user. Rails generate device user will create our migration that we love so much that will update our database to have um, a user, it gives us our user.rv class file, it gives us some tests, and our root that we're talking about. So we'll look really quick at a couple of those pieces. So here's all the other caveat within Rails. There's something called Rails engines. Rails engines are a package of model, view, and controller elements. And so device, because it has views, because it has models, because it has controllers, it's almost like its own Rails application all by itself. But it doesn't operate as its own Rails application. It looks to your application as the main application. So it's subordinate to it. So just know that Rails engines exist out there. So that command we just ran, it created a new class called user that inherits a bracket record. And it set up a bunch of device configuration. So it tells it tells device that this class has some capabilities. So we can recover from the database. We can log into it with a password. We can create a new one with a password. There's a couple other ones. Um, and then they've generated our getters and setters for things like email and passwords. And that. It also generated um, a change to our route file, so config routes.rv. They have a method called devise for users. And since it's a Rails engine, <coughs> it has its own set of controllers and stuff, and this lets devise know that it should care about our new user model. And so what all of this has done is given us new routes. So here we can actually look at fake routes looking at earlier. And now we have a whole bunch of them. We have our ones that we I created with posts, and now we have all the ones that Tobias <coughs> created. So we have user slash sign in for logging in. Um, you know that's a git. It goes to our device slash sessions controller and calls the new. So this is a really good <coughs> tool to leverage a lot of times is to understand where do I go to access certain controller actions. And what is my roots file really doing? Um, and again, this is all prioritized. So it goes through and says, does it match this? Does it match this? Does it match this? Does it match this? And eventually, if it doesn't get anything, it's done. So you run a running database is my SQL on this one. This one's actually running SQLite. It's okay. Um, SQLite is a good development database, you don't need to actually set anything up, it's just a file that exists and it goes mm -hmm. through there. Um, that's the default, so you don't need to change anything to actually set that up. Um, so let's check, oh we didn't actually run. And since we generated a migration, we need to do our rank db migrate again. We can just take a peek at it, because it's an interesting migration file. So I created our users table. A user has an email, an encrypted password, some tokens, some sign-in information. Um, indexes. We 
now and authenticate to our website. So, if we recall, we have our user slash sign in page. Sign-in page. It looks great, doesn't it? It's pretty awesome. I'll fix that later. So we can sign up. Enter in some password data. Put in an email. Test one two four. Test one two four. Sign up. Hey, we're back to our index page. Now you can't actually see that we're logged in, but Devise is actually now tracking that my email is derek.data@rockwell.gmail.com. It knows it has some like session information for me. It knows that I'm authenticated. Um, so now we can do cool stuff where we go into this index page. Um, views. Welcome, index. welcome. So now actually let's say welcome and then my email. Now we can do some uh, embedded Ruby here, and we can check uh, user signed in. Yeah, that's the active item that I want to check. So we'll check if we we have someone that's signed in, and then if we do, we will echo. So assuming I picked the right method name here, Devise gave us a method called user signed in that communicates and said, did someone actually sign on the website? If they did, enter this email. Otherwise, just display this text, not logged in yet. Um, so now if we run this, since I'm logged in, I hopefully will get my email. Oh, right. But, So since it's a Rails engine, it's actually referring back to the local installation of um, device, and it's referring back to that. But device actually gives you the option of digging into that stuff. So I can actually pull up device's views and it'll actually import those views into my project. Um, so if I run that command, then I can actually look at yeah, how so the bias is actually looking. You actually have to run a command. Oh, um, cool. Can you do that? Sorry? Actually, so it doesn't automatically read through all the controls and use what it does. You've got to run the command. It, it does. They're, they're embedded deep into the engine, um, but if you override the namespace in the views folder, then you can just, your, the precedence happens within your Rails, in your app views folder. So if you have a file there that collides with the same namespace as your device, your app's HTML file is always good. So he's just copied all of the device files up into his app, and so then whatever changes he makes, they're going to be the ones that are rendered. Yep. 
So here's an interesting thing with the buys is logging out requires me to send a delete HTTP request to this URL. It's kind of difficult to do that with just the URL string because you have to do like some fancy curling. So what I'm going to do is create a link that allows me to log out once I'm logged in, right? And so we can actually put it right at the bottom there, maybe? No, no, whatever. Somewhere. Somewhere. So, do some more rubiness. So, in Ruby on Rails, we want to generate a link. There's a helper called link2. And I don't really remember where we're going, so we can go back to our right roots thing. And we want to go to destroy user session. That's kind of a, a Rails pointer to this URL. Um, so if we go to destroy user session, <coughs> that is going to generate a link to user slash sign up. And I'll show you what. So I generate a link. It's not a good name, so we'll change the name. There is an example of when you don't need parentheses. Someone was asking about that earlier. It was you. So you can either do that, or you can forego the parentheses and just have it be that. <coughs> Typically, it's a two without. But. So now it says log out, and if I click on it, anyone want to have some guess what's going to happen? Nothing. Why? Delete. Huh? There it is. No route matches get who's a sign out. Because the device roots don't include a get sign out. It's only delete. What the crap? So, Ruby on Rails, being wonderful, has an option called method. Oh. And so now that link is going to send a delete request to that URL instead of get. Could you inspect that log out? Just want to see what the code is there. Oh, you want to look at more Ruby magic, don't you? website, not to click this, because if you're, well, if you do things like delete things, or you don't want robots to be rolling around your website deleting things. So if you don't put a rel nofollow there, robots are just going to delete anything that it can touch that can be deleted. So that's what the rel nofollow is there for. Um, I think there's actually, there's a downgrade to this. About it. If I open this up in like I <coughs> Rails automatically will downgrade the functionality to not be HTML5. It'll actually downgrade it due to some JavaScript. The Rails actually it creates a no, 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 no. It creates a form that just has that one link, and then it does some other things in it. So Rails is actually doing a whole, whole, whole lot of stuff, which is why you want to do a framework instead of just loading up some PHP or Ruby and making your website. Um, so now I can log in, log out. 
Now, when I'm not logged in, I have a login button. And when I'm logged in, I have a logout button. That's cool. So what happens when I access posts? You know, all my posts are there. Um, I would see all the posts that anybody ever created. So if I logged in as a different user, I'll just do that really quick just to show you. Actually, yes. It's doing um, an HTML5 email field, and that's automatically validating it for you. Um, just, I'm looking at the post from the other guy. That's not that cool. Um, so, this goes back to your question of how do we know who owns what posts? So, now what we can do is associate a user or a post with a user. And so the first step to doing that is informing Ruby that the objects are related. And that's, <coughs> it's called a has a belongs to relationship. So if you think about it, um, think of this room as an object. This room has many tables. It has a Weston, it has a Derek. Um, you can consider Derek belonging to this room at this given moment if you're thinking about how, you know, we're, we're, I'm currently in this space, so I belong to the room, in that sense. And so that's kind of how that relationship is managed within Ruby. So we can go into our user class. We can tell Ruby on Rails that a user um, has many <coughs> posts. And then we can tell Ruby that a post belongs to a user. And now what this does is it tells Ruby on Rails to expect certain things while this relationship. So it's letting us know that a post has a user ID, but we don't, we never created the user ID in the database. So it's going to get to me. So if I create a post here, Oh, I didn't need load my load rail to change the model. <laughs> so the black magic that's going on in the covers is the fact that the has many and belongs to is setting up more than <coughs> relationships, which then Rails will automatically recognize and use um, in order to create the relationship between objects. Yes. Is that active record then or more anything? So now I want to add that foreign key to our post. So again, generating migration. Add user to posts. Oops,
that doesn't stick with me. I've been doing it forever, but it's just like, it never sticks. Oh, headed rails instead of brake. <laughs> now we've got a user ID in posts, so now we can actually start associating those. Um, and check if you start your server. Interestingly enough, not for that. Because the queries are dynamically accessed in the database, so you don't need to change it. When you need to reload rails is when you're changing the actual model because it's already it's all loaded, it's already but it's not updating the models as you change them. Well, okay, yeah, caveat: there's a little gem out there called Zeus that will automatically reload your environment anytime anything changes. It always watches it, so you never have to do the whole restart business. And on projects that take 20 seconds to spin up, so nice. <laughs> also nice for the test. Yeah, and so now. When we go to that index, we don't care about all the posts. We only want to see posts that belong to our current user. Actually, interesting backup here. But I only should allow people to see posts if they're logged in. Right now, I can access my posts when they're logged in. And the way that you can actually add that feature and devise is do a before filter. So before filter is indicating that anytime or before you call any of these methods, <coughs> run whatever you call them before filter. So that can be just a method. <coughs> In this case, it's going to be the authenticate user method that device is created for us. What's that exclamation point? Uh, um, the exclamation point is an indication that the method is changing something. Um, there's also the question mark, which is a generating, it's telling you that this thing returns a true or false. It's just an indication that it's, it's acting a certain way, so you think twice before you do it. Um, you know, if you're calling a method as an exclamation point, you're like, wait, was it changing? In this case, it's changing the route that you're going to. So if you're trying to go to slash posts, it won't let you unless you're logged in. So now when I go to slash posts, I'm expecting it to not go, it's supposed to bring up this log sign-in page. But when I sign in, see there's the red around it, it's the HTML5. Changed it from post at all to whatever it would need to be to only show the post relevant to the user. So can you put the before filter in certain methods? Like Sorry. if you're trying to create a post, you need to be authenticated, but not if you're yep. actually doing it. You can um, do an acceptor only, so you can find fine tune uh, where it is and where it doesn't. You can also put it other in the within the application controller. And then this is like Ruby specifically, but it's used in a lot of then from magic regions that Ruby can Yeah, and that's what the response and that's how we send you in to join the case statement to have a pen and a pen to try and what you want. Is it still like this? Yes. So now that I've changed that, theoretically, if I got the syntax right, if I log out, now I should be able to view all the posts because I'm all logged in, but I can't view specific posts because I put that in there. It's so cool. And then if you wanted to have two before filters, you could you could just declare there would be a before filter would happen on each line rather than tagging them or creating a before <coughs> filters. So now we can actually use, since we have authenticated our user, we know that we have a current user. The device gave us that method current user to let us you know, give us access to the object that represents that person. Um, just like we used in the, in the view to get the email or the current user.email. Now we actually have a method called current user.posts. 
So that was given to us when we did, um, when we told our user class that it has many posts. That gave us the user.posts method as our getter. So now, I'll go back to my post controller, save it, and then do that. I have no more, no more posts anymore because I haven't related, or I haven't created any posts that have a relationship to the code I'm excited to. Um, so now, theoretically, if I'm in here and I did blah, 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 and then saved it, it should be there, right? But it's not. It gives. Because I haven't, when I submitted that, I didn't associate that post with the user. So I would go down to my create method here. See this post got saved? That's actually where that post is going back to our database to be persisted, to be saved forever. So now the post that new params post. This doesn't have anything, any information about our user. We didn't let that form know that our user ID was in there. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to do it. We can embed a user ID in that form, or we can actually just associate our uh, user with the post after the fact before it saves. Um, I would typically do this method uh, because you want to be wary when you start changing user IDs and stuff in a form because anyone can change that before they submit a form. They can just post user ID 7,866 instead of whatever user you may be logged in as. So if I do post.user equal current user, now when I save that object, it'll associate that user to be whoever assigned it. You could. Um, theoretically, yeah, you would. Yeah. Um, I just had to make that out here. It's just as well. It's just the current. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so now I'm listing all my posts. I have a post that is related to me. If I log out and log in as my other guy, Then I go to post as this email. There's no post. So um, the, all the posts you added before you associated the current user with posts just have an empty field in the database for the Yep, they user? have a user ID of nil, so they're never really going to show up anywhere because they don't have an associate existing. Um, Ideally, when you add the user field, we might write like this. Yeah. yeah. Questions with all that? So that showed us how to incorporate device to do certain add to that user functionality. Um, that kind of started showing how we relate some of those resources together. It showed us how much control things like Rails engines have with creating new routes and stuff. Um, there was a lot there. Um, let's put it on the internet. One quick question. Sure, sure. You're doing headers and footers and all kinds of stuff, any kind of static stuff that you might want to do in there. Is there a way that you typically would do that in yep. Rails? There's what's called templates. <clears throat> um, so for example, right here I have a layout application.html that ERB. So this is the the master. This is the oh, very okay, top the of page. that structure. Okay. So there's a few things going on here. It's loading all of our JavaScript, the style sheets, it's got our head, title, HTML, doc type, body, blah, 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 and this yield. This yield is actually pulling up whatever index.html or show to HTML. It's going to be here. So those other engines you mentioned, not engines, what's the right term? The generate, the camel, or whatever, yeah. Yep. Do they do it the same way, or is it yep. everyone's doing it differently? Um, for example, devise, um, well, here we go, this is a good example. Here's a underscore form that HTML that you that's called a template. And so that's actually getting used in do. 
So this is new to HTML. This is what's loaded by we go to um, posts new. It's loading this. So actually, this render form is saying that there is a template called form that needs to get dropped in right there. Yeah. They also refer to them as partials. Partials. Oh, sure. There's sometimes you'll see methods in yeah. projects where it's render partial. And so you're saying, don't render. I just want to render a short snippet. And it's an explicit way of saying we're rendering a little bit of HTML here, here, here. Yep. So this is where like a graphics artist would give them those files that would tweak them so they can make it fancy yep. and whatever. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so there's definitely ways where you can break a <coughs> website into very small pieces. Um, and then also you can use this form partial in a bunch of different ways. Um, so if you ever use the same HTML snippet of code, like five pages, you could turn that into a template or a partial, and then just start running it. Does that form have to be in a certain place? Like if you're making a new user, you have to use um, So render form here. This is doing some Ruby magic that says, in the current directory, look for underscore form.html. They just kind of shorten it down to that Google syntax. Um, but if it was in a, a subdirectory, you could do um, layouts form. What if you wanted to use, uh, you know, coming back to the kind of the beautifying look part of it, do something like Bootstrap or one of these other <coughs> UI? Want to see Bootstrap? There you go. Basically, just throw it in as the at that master page or something. You just do a gem install. Oh. Right now, take five seconds. JavaScript specific gems is that you're not just referencing Ruby code, but you're referencing um, essentially a list of CSS and JS files, and then you're adding it to your manifest files, which then there's a bootstrap in Falcon, which then get compiled through an asset pipeline, which minifies your JS and CSS for you automatically. Or Google has an idea. So, doing front end work with Rails is not just simply bundle install. Sometimes there's a couple little finagulations or configurations that you do that make everything all sit together. So, now that I've done that, Also, um, on the what do I do next page on the event, there's a one page. There's something called the Read Files podcast, and they essentially take five minutes, two times a week, and run through Twitter. So often, times they'll say, "Here's here's that about a gem. Here's what it does. Why you should use it." And they manage different ones.
If you're using scaffolds, I know that there's like an overall. Mm -hmm. So they do, they allow you to work with Git. Git is a, um, a version control system, so if you're familiar with SVN, yeah, actually I'll do it from other day. So here if you leverages uh, the Git version control system where you can actually push a Ruby on Rails app to the cloud and then do all the deployment and make it be in there accessible. There's a few, two or three steps um, that you need to do to actually get up there. Um, first of all, I mean, you need, you need a login, so you need to create an account. Heroku is free um, for a certain level of traffic, um, but I definitely recommend it just because you can do cool stuff like this. So I can do some different things. Is it a good thing? This will still allow us to use our database when my just run Rails server, but now when Heracu knows about it, it's going to completely ignore this gem, and then it'll get rid of that error. Does it use a different database? Yep, uh, Heracu uses Postgres. Okay. Yep. Uh, which actually, thank you for reminding me. I need to include the Postgres gem. I am. So we include the Postgres gem. Should that be for like a production or anything? Sorry? Should that have a wrapper for production only? Because you don't want that. Um, it can be in my development instance. I'm just not using it. Oh, okay. Um, because there's the second piece of that that Weston talked about. Remember that develop or that database that YML file? Heroku mm -hmm. actually overwrites that, but um, your local environment it, it won't use Postgres and tell you it's it's Postgres database. So do a bundle install. I commit my changes. Heroku. Remove SQLite from yeah, like developing the three reductions. Then I 
do my Heroku git push Heroku. So push that. And then new commit up to Heroku. Um, it's going to do the same stuff. This time it should be a little faster because that local environment already has one of these gems. It's going to error again. So there's an interesting thing. I'm not going to dive into the details because it would me get confused for a very long time. But it's trying to connect to a database that doesn't exist yet. So you're getting a connection refused there. Um, that's because your Rails app is actually initializing. So there's a configuration that if you, it's pretty easy to Google. If you Google just Heroku connection refused, it's pretty much so you'll see the error that we just saw there. They outline it. They blow it up a bit and they give you a solution down here. So they tell you to put it in your application.rd file. So that's your configuration file for your application. And this tells it to don't start the Rails app until you're absolutely done initializing it. Um, and that'll get rid of that connection. So we go to that file that they told us about. So we put that new line of code there. We uh, commit it. Fixed Heroku assets. <coughs> So just to compare the process of uh, Heroku versus running your own system, um, if I were to boot up an Amazon environment, I would have to set up Ruby on Rails, I would have to set up the database, I would have to configure the database YML file, I would have to configure the firewalls, I would have to handle the uh, um, upload and download of the files. It's, it's all pretty much a heinous process. Um, so this does cost a little more if you're above and beyond the free model, but it's well worth it for 99%. So unless you really enjoy systems administration, I don't. I'd rather just be done. So launching done, version 7, um, deployed to Heroku, give you a URL. If I open that link, um, I actually error in some case. Um, the first time you run your application, it hangs for a while because it's booting up the Ruby on Rails environment. Um, there's a couple ways to work around it. Um, but it'll go to sleep in you know, 10, 15 minutes, and then you'll do it again. And then map. <laughs> Anyone want to hazard a guess why I got this there? Anyone? Somebody you might know. If there was one step SQL missed, did you say SQL? SQL, SQL. Kind of, yes. It is database related. I didn't push my migrations to her. Oops. That's weird. And the way they can do that in Heroku is Heroku run I have to be detached. Reasons that are um, so you basically have, I don't even know the regular command for this. Is it just a removal run? Is it just is it the same thing without the yeah, attachment? Without the attachment home. So now this will, this will tell Heroku to perform a rake db migrate on the code that you just ran. So just like we do a db migrate in our environment, this will do it on Heroku.